Every time NASCAR goes to a super speedway, fans and drivers alike are on the lookout for the big one. Whenever one car gets turned near the front of the pack, fans can do nothing but hope their favorite driver makes it through. We've seen crashes in the past, like Tony Stewart's 2012 crash in the Good Sam's Roadside Assistance 500 at Talladega, where only a couple of cars made it through. But what would happen if no one survived a crash? Well, that's what happened in 1956 at Asheville Weaverville in NASCAR's Convertible Series. Today, we're going to talk about one of the wildest races in NASCAR's history. Asheville Weaverville has a long and storied history in NASCAR. It was founded in a pretty conventional way for the time. About a year after the first sanctioned NASCAR race at Daytona Beach, Bill France paid a visit to a former bootlegger, Gene Slutter, who was planning on opening an airfield near Weaverville, North Carolina. France approached Gene and said, It's a good field, Gene, but it would make a better parking lot. Why don't you build a racetrack beside it? A good conversation with Bill France is all it took to convince Gene, as he would remain owner and promoter of the track. Work began on a new half-mile dirt oval, as Gene wanted the track to be packed with action. So the track was built with 25 degrees of banking in each turn to keep speed up through the corners. That is ridiculous banking for a half-mile oval. Just for comparison, Daytona's banking is just 6 degrees higher at 31. The track was built quickly, with the first NASCAR race being held on August 20th, 1950. It was only a modified race, but the fan turnout was great and well-received. The track quickly became known as the fastest half-mile anywhere. The next year, it was added to the Grand National Series, and over the next few years, the track would be the Flock Brothers' playground. Bonnie Flock led all 200 laps in the first race there, and was on pace to do it again in 1952. Unfortunately, a tie rod failed after leading the first 129 laps, but no worries as Bob Flock led the remaining 79 laps en route to his fourth and final win. Just for good measure, Tim Flock finished in second. Bonnie would come back the next time and lead all 200 laps again, so he had led every single lap he completed at the track in three races. Anyway, getting back on track, let's fast forward to late 1955. NASCAR purchased a racing series from the organization SAFE, which was a league that raced convertibles. Convertibles were new and exciting for consumers in the mid-50s, so Bill France and NASCAR thought that this could be an opportunity to make way for another popular racing series. The first season was slated to start in 1956 with a 47-race schedule. Race 46 was a stop at Asheville-Weaverville Speedway. Unfortunately for Gene, who was in charge of promoting this race, he was never going to draw in a huge crowd as the Grand National Series was racing at Orange County a couple of hours away. But Gene did manage to draw in about 5,000 race fans. Additionally, most of the big names in the Convertible Series would drop down from the Grand National Series. With the bigger purse and prestige of the Grand National Series, most drivers would obviously pick that race over the Convertible Series. Still, 24 drivers entered the race, including many recognizable names. Joe Weatherly, Glenn Wood, and Curtis Turner. Turner was a proven winner in the Grand National Series, but he opted to primarily compete in the convertible division in 1956. This was probably because it was cheaper to run the series, and instead of finishing between 6th and 15th in the Grand Nationals, he could win most of the convertible races and collect the grand prize purse money. This worked rather well for Turner, as he made more than $29,000 in the convertible division in 1956 alone. This was more than all of his winnings in the Grand National Series from 1949 to 1955. Turner won the pole for the 200 lap race and would lead the field of 24 drivers. However, three would not start as a result of disqualification. As the race went on, three more drivers dropped out due to mechanical failures. Other than racing each other and battling the tough track, there was another factor that Dust had to deal with. Dust. It was pretty common for dirt tracks to dry out over the course of a long race during the summer, but this race was especially dusty. 
After the race, Glenwood said the track kept getting dustier and dustier as time went on. We kept running through the dust on the backstretch coming off turn two, then we'd pop out on the other side and you could see again. But you couldn't see a thing as you went into it. Amazingly, the race was pretty much accident free. But the drivers knew once a crash happened, it would be certain disaster. With about 20 laps to go, Jimmy Macy had a wheel hub break. His car shot in the direction of Lewis Possum Jones's car. The two collided and stuck together until they hit a dirt embankment. Both drivers were spit back out onto the racetrack, on their sides, and in the main racing line. Dust kicked up everywhere. No one could see a thing. Cars started to pile in one after another, trying to navigate their way through the crash. Others tried to avoid the wreck by driving through the infield, but they ended up wrecking as well. Wood recalled, all of a sudden, there were cars wrecked in that dust. I didn't know it. There wasn't a caution or anything, or if there was, I didn't see it. Evidently, no one else did either. I went into that dust into a pile of cars wide open. It threw me down across the steering wheel and split my nose and mouth open. I started to get up and get out of the car and I about passed out, so I just sat back down. I remember seeing Joe Weatherly getting out of his car and he jumped on the fence and just hung onto it. They kept piling in there. They just kept on hitting. Finally, the wreck came to an end. Every single car in the field was stopped in the melee, except for one. Curtis Turner was leading the race while Massey and Jones were battling and eventually crashed, but they were directly behind Turner despite being several laps down. So Turner was lucky enough for the other 12 cars running to pile in, and by the time he got to the scene of the crash, he could drive super slow and pick his way through the cars and debris. During the wreck, the closest call was for Possum Jones. Back in the day, whenever pile-ups started, especially in the convertible series, car safety was very much lacking. Drivers didn't want to be sitting in their car waiting for oncoming traffic to slam into them, so they would often jump out of their car and run to safety. Remember, they didn't have caution lights or spotters either, so they would just have to hope other drivers reacted fast enough to slam on the brakes and avoid the chaos. Well, this is what Possum Jones was trying to do, but as he was climbing out of his car, another driver crashed into him. Jones was knocked high into the air, but was relatively unharmed. He was super lucky to escape with minor chest contusions that were treated at the racetrack. Massey, John Wood, and two other drivers were sent to the hospital for treatment, but there were no serious injuries. Of course, there was going to be a debate about the cause of the wreck. Immediately, many spectators assumed it was the dirt, but a majority of the drivers actually complained that it was the glare from the sun blinded them for about half of the lap. As far as the race goes, what happened after the crash? There were still 20 laps left. Well, NASCAR was staring at several driver injuries and a cleanup time of several hours with only one car capable of running they made a pretty easy decision to call the race. This has been the only race ended due to a lack of competition. Curtis Turner was declared the winner of the race, his 22nd of the season. Usually, I do a conclusion on these videos, how safety was improved as a result of the wreck or some heroic ending for one of the drivers. But nothing really came as a result of this wreck. Everyone basically said, wow, glad everyone was okay packed their bags for the next race, and moved on. It's still an incredible story about a largely forgotten series that I've had a lot of fun researching over the last couple of years. And that's it for this video. I hope you guys did enjoy. This was something I had never heard about until I discovered it just a couple of weeks ago, so I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you did enjoy the video, make sure you leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. But that's it for me. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.